Hello, my name is Rosalind Love and I'm from the Department of Anglo-Saxon, Norse and Celtic, known as ASNAC for short. And I'd like to introduce you to my colleague, Dr Elizabeth Rowe. Hi Elizabeth, would you like to tell us which part of the ASNAC course you're responsible for? Hi Rosalind, good to talk to you today. Um, yes, very happy to explain what I do. I teach the history of Scandinavia in the Viking Age. And what does that inv involve or, co or cover exactly? So what we do is over four teaching terms, we look at the history of the Vikings um, in different areas. So um, Denmark from the Viking Age on to the beginning of the Middle Ages, Norway, the same period. Um, the module on Sweden covers not only Sweden, but also the Baltic Islands in the Viking Age and also the expansion of the Vikings to Russia, the Ukraine, and even farther afield. And then the fourth module covers the expansion to the west, to the North Atlantic colonies. So we look at the Viking settlements in, in Orkney and the Faroes, um, Iceland, Greenland, and North America. We, fo we focus on um, the history of the Vikings as their own people in their homelands and in their colonies. So it's not so much about Viking raids, although Viking raids definitely come into it, but we fo focus on the Vikings at home. So that actually uh, explains quite a lot about how, how Scandinavian history kind of links up with the other parts of the ASNAP course. I mean, uh, are there natural connections with the other areas? Um, yes, uh, the connections are, are very easy, easy to make. So on the history side, if you're interested in Viking raids in England, then the Anglo-Saxon history paper supplies what it's like to be on the receiving end of those raids. Um, and the same thing, um, Vikings in Ireland, so the history of the Gaelic speaking peoples. Mm. Uh, covers that part of things. And if you're interested in Viking culture, then the paper on Old Norse language and literature treats the, the Viking poems and sagas and so forth um, as they come to us from medieval Iceland. Yeah, fantastic. Everybody loves the Vikings. It's sort of, they're, they're very present in popular culture, but why should we be studying Scandinavian history in the 21st century? Why is it important? There, there are a number of reasons why it's not just interesting to do it, but it's important to do it. So one thing is because the popular representation of Vikings is very often wrong or incomplete. And if you think you like the Vikings, from what you see, I don't know, in the movies or on the television, you're not knowing the real Vikings. And so if you think this is interesting at all, it's really best to study the actual history and get the scholarly views mm -hmm. rather than some partial view of the Vikings that's been shaped to make a good television program. Another reason why it's important to study the Vikings at this <clears throat> particular moment is that Viking, the idea of the Vikings has been co-opted in mm -hmm. modern history for all kinds of evil purposes. And in order to be critical thinkers, critical receivers of modern, modern history, modern political movements, um, in order to form your own opinions, you need to have your own knowledge, you need to have accurate knowledge, and you can't rely on what you might be getting through through social media. So it's very important to know the real history in order to be able to deal with actual modern politics. Yeah. And yet another reason why it's important to be studying the Vikings now is that there have been amazing amazing progress um, in modern technology. And so science and archaeology are showing us things about the Vikings that we had no notion of before. So we can look at fire starters in, in Newfoundland and say, well, this piece came from Iceland, but this piece came from Greenland. Or we can do ground penetrating radar and we can see Viking age towns in mm. Norway where nobody ever thought there was a town yeah. before. Or we can do DNA, DNA analysis of bones and say, ah, so this, these, this grave is actually uh, that of a woman, even though she's buried with weapons. Or we can do isotope analysis and say, 
you have somebody who looks as though they're buried in a Viking context, but in fact, they've come from Central Asia. So we know so much more than we did before. The 21st century Vikings are a thousand times more interesting than <laughs> were a mere 20 years ago. Sure. So that sort of brings me to another thing I'd like to ask. What, what is the range of sources or types of evidence that students have to grapple with when they're studying Scandinavian history with you? Well, um, it's a very broad range indeed. And in case anybody is worried about having to read runes in the original or anything <laughs> like that, everything the students deal with, they deal with in English translation. But because the Vikings didn't leave any long detailed histories of themselves, we really need to use the broadest possible range of evidence to get the best possible picture of what they do. So we look at um, the Vikings' own writings, which come to us in the form of runic inscriptions, but we also look at what people outside the Vikings have said about them. And so that ranges from, um, say, accounts in the, the annals of, of uh, early Ireland and Anglo-Saxon England, mm -hmm. all the way to um, the Middle Eastern part of the world where Arabic travelers and diplomats and traders encountered the Vikings as, um, as merchants and wow. they wrote their own descriptions in, in Arabic. So wow. we have a broad range of non-Norse textual uh, sources that we need to look at. And then in addition to that, we use um, evidence such as place names that can tell us about um, the kinds of uh, social functions that happened at particular locations. Mm -hmm. And also because a lot of place names have the names of Norse gods in them, we can tell which gods were worshiped where. So place wow. names, although it sounds boring, are actually quite interesting to look at. Fantastic. And then on top of that, we have um, uh, could come various types of uh, scientific knowledge. I mentioned the, the isotopes and, oh, yeah, yeah. and pollen analysis yeah. can say, you know, when did the settlement of the pharaohs actually happen uh -huh. or was Iceland really deforested? Um, and so there's a lot of um, scientific material that we can use. But above all, archeology span really is our friend. We may not never discover any more texts that tell us about the Vikings, but um, archeology span is um, a, a well of great depth and there are many finds to be discussed and many more finds to, to be found. So material objects are essential when uh, learning about the Vikings. Could you, could you show us an example of, a, of an object and what, how it can and help us to think back to, to, into the past? That will, that will be really great to see yeah, and hear you absolutely. talk absolutely. If you just give me yeah, a second yeah. here, I will no, that's, share that's fine. the screen. And I, think, I think it's that kind of that kind of practical experience of of seeing a thing and hearing somebody talk about it in a knowledgeable way, which is which is which is really um, the special the special part about um, the possibilities of material culture. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with any luck, the screen is being shared, yeah. and if my PowerPoint will wake up. <laughs> here we go here we go wow so tell us about this what is this i mean it, it's labeled there but but tell us a bit more about it elizabeth okay so what this is is um a small figurine of a woman and you can tell that she's a woman because she's wearing a long garment and also she has long hair that's been knotted in a characteristic style that we see of nearly every depiction of, of a woman from Viking Age art, but also she's got um, a characteristic round Viking shield and she's got a drawn sword in her hand. So this is very, very unusual in yeah. the general <clears throat> Viking Age view of the world. So I should mention that like, yes, it's from Denmark and it's been dated to around the year 800. So it's wow, fairly it's early, early in, yeah. you know, in, in the Viking Age. Um, so in actual Viking Age culture, there's a very um, uh, distinct uh, social differentiation between the genders. The men are supposed to do the fighting. It's the men who participate in legal activity in the assemblies and it, women <clears throat> are expected to pretty much stay in the domestic sphere 
Um, and they are not supposed to be warriors and they're not supposed to wear men's clothing, for example. So it's really quite interesting to see that in the mentality of the Vikings, in their beliefs, that armed women had a very prominent position. Yeah. And so this is why this little figurine has been characterized as an amulet of a Valkyrie. And for those of you who may not know, um, Valkyries are part of the Norse pre-Christian belief system. And these are female deities who um, are thought to choose the men who would die in battle. So the idea of Valkyries riding through the sky and, and using a spear to point it at the man who's going to, to meet his death. And then when he dies in battle, he goes to Valhalla um, to spend his days fighting and his evenings feasting. And then when the end of the gods come at Ragnarok, um, then all the these dead warriors in Valhalla will be summoned to fight on behalf of the gods against the frost giants and the trolls and all the creatures of, of evil. So in some ways, dying in battle is the ticket that lets you get the best afterlife. Um, uh -huh. Everybody else goes to a cold, dark, miserable place, um, which is the realm of the death goddess Hell, mm. from which we get our modern uh, modern uh, idea of of Hell. So that actually comes to us from uh, from from the Norse. And so, what's particularly interesting about this? There, there's two ways in which this is interesting. And so, one is the is that this is not this standard depiction of the Valkyrie, although right, I said okay. it is a Valkyrie. So if we, um, if I can get this to swap. So mm -hmm. here is another um, amulet of a Valkyrie, and this is a much more characteristic depiction. Wow. So this too is a figure in a long dress, so it's a female, and also the hair is knotted, and possibly mm -hmm. the ponytail, um, the rest of the ponytail is broken off this particular amulet, right. but you can see the knot yeah. here. Yeah. So what this Valkyrie is doing is that she's offering um, a drinking horn, which would be filled with mead, and so um, this is the Valkyrie in the act of welcoming the dead warriors to Valhalla. So we see, so this is very, very common. And yeah. this aspect of the Valkyries emphasizes the, um, the fun and festivity of, of the afterlife. That, that yeah. if you're killed in battle, um, a woman with a flowing dress and a long ponytail is, is going to greet you at the door with a horn full of alcoholic beverage. And there's going to be one long what could be, what, Yeah, what could, what could be, what could be better <laughs> than, than that? And so there are many, many, many of these amulets that have been found across the Viking world. Um, and so there presumably warriors would wear these in the hopes that, um, that they would uh, be able to go to Valhalla when, when, they, when they died. Yeah. But if we go return to this particular yeah. figure of, um, of a woman, we see her doing something else. She's not offering the, the drinking horn of mead. Instead, she's standing, standing alert, head, head high, shield and sword at the ready. And so here, what we see is the development of the idea of the Valkyrie from being a generalized um, female welcome uh, at the par the big party at Valhalla to being a personal protector. Um, so not just the, the spirit that's going to point you out for death, but somebody who might actually take up that spear, or in this case, take up sword and shield to protect you in battle. Uh -huh. And so the idea that you might want to to survive your battle <laughs> rather than being killed uh, and, and going to Valhalla is a really interesting difference. The idea that, that these figures could be protective figures um, as well as um, sex and death figures is, is, quite, is quite a difference. Um, so one way in which that's interesting is that it shows beliefs changing or a variety of beliefs um, being possible at the beginning of the Viking Age. And so it's always good to realize that the Vikings have a dynamic culture. It doesn't stay the it's same throughout the course of the Viking Age. And there's quite a lot of variation across, across the region. 
Um, so this amulet lets you lets you know that. Another way in which this is important is that this figure of the Valkyrie as more of a protective figure um, is actually the Valkyrie that we see from Norse poetry in right. the Edda. So if um, scholars might wonder, is, is an Edda poem that shows a kind of a, a love affair between a human warrior and his Valkyrie pr protectress. Is this a poem that's late because it's influenced by medieval romance or could this actually be an early Viking Age idea? A figuring like this says that at least it's possible that it could be an early poem. It doesn't necessarily have to be a late, a late one. Mm -hmm. And then the third way in which it is interesting is that um, it, challenges the what would seem to be the very strong uh, gender division in actual Old Norse culture that right, I was yes, describing I was say, earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because here, if people uh, could so easily not just mentally imagine a woman with with weapons, but they actually had the physical object to say, here's here's a woman uh, with her with her sword and her shield. Um, it's a much smaller leap um, to go from that to an actual woman who is fighting. And yeah, do we have any evidence have, for yeah. female warriors? Is there any other evidence for for Viking female warriors? That is that is a question that's absolutely being investigated at at the moment. Mm -hmm. So, um, right, how do we how do we get started with uh, <laughs> with, with this one? It's quite so, easy. <laughs> right. So on the um, on the negative side, there is absolutely there are no records whatsoever of people who have been attacked by Viking raiding parties saying that women were the among women. the fighters. Yes. There were certainly women at Viking camps um, and and part of larger Viking armies going around. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's absolutely been been proven. So women were part of the the viking overseas <laughs> raiding yeah. experience but yeah. there's no not a single record that says i was i was in a fight and and i got close to my enemy and he turned out to be a she, a she like yeah. nothing i mean yeah. so if this was any kind of a, a common thing we would hear about people it people would people would have remarked on it wouldn't they yeah absolutely it would because it would have been very unusual yeah. and unheard of in their own cultures yeah. and they certainly would have remarked on it if they'd yeah. seen it yeah. But then on the other side of things, we do definitely have some burials where the remains are, have scientifically been shown to be the remains of women and they have been buried with weapons. Wow. So the question is, are these weapon burials um, symbolic? Um, so a woman in real life comes to a position of, of power, she's, she's a queen or, or has a position of, of leadership and, and so the weapons are symbols of that sure. political power that she has. Is it possible that a woman with weapons has some sort of function within um, a religious context and, and she's some kind of, of priestess? Um, and so again, the weapons are a symbol, but a symbol of a quite different kind of power. Right. Or is it possible that these are burials, or at least some of them are burials of women who did actually okay. fight? Yeah. And so um, the most famous or notorious burial that's that's been in the news in recent years is of a Birka, um, so a burial um, on a small island in a Swedish, a Swedish lake, um, an island that used to be um, a small town for international trade. And so the burial um, was found by the fortress. So there's a fortress guarding the town that's full of valuable furs and, and silver and things like that. So it makes sense that there's a fortress above the town. It makes sense that there were warriors buried by the fortress. And so it's quite interesting that one of these burials is of, um, is of a woman with weapons. But also that burial is unusual because some of the objects um, are not standard Norse weapons. So there's a Middle Eastern style wow. um, um, bow, um, and and this is not what we would expect in a Viking Age warrior's mm -hmm. burial. Um, and also there are some 
uh, decorative uh, bits of jewelry that also seem to come from the Middle East. And then weirdly enough, the date of the burial is after the town was largely abandoned and the international function of the town moved to another town on the shore of the lake. Wow. So whatever warriors were doing on this mostly abandoned island is not at all explained, and so so far at least. And so between the mystery of the Middle Eastern aspects of the burial and the political context, and then the fact that it's it's a woman, um, there are lots of questions. It could be that she was she was a warrior. Um, mm -hmm. If you're an archer, uh, accuracy yeah. is more important than physical strength, but there are many questions and the possibility is still definitely open. Wow, it makes, it makes Scandinavian history seem like, a, a, like um, a lot of detective, fascinating detective work of, of many skills brought together. Um, it, it, is, it is absolutely, and this is one of the terrific strengths of the ASNAC program, because in order to get the most accurate solution to the mystery of what's happening, you need to look at absolutely everything. So you need a historical grounding, you need to understand the texts that form an important yeah. part of our understanding of, of what's happening. And yeah. so you need to take this multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary approach to be most convincing in your solution to the mystery. Yeah, fantastic. That really, really, really wants me, makes me want to um, study Scandinavian history. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Thank you very much. My pleasure. My pleasure. Okay, thank you. Okay, then. Bye-bye.